All right. How's everybody doing? Sleepy. I know. Yep. The food coma is starting to hit, right? Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm, where's my lazy boy, man? I just need a recliner here. All right, so we're going to try and get rolling. I got a lot of material to cover, and Karina is going to give me the big shtick here in a little while, so I want to make sure that I get over the stuff I have to talk about. So my name is Frane Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Thank you for joining this afternoon. Um, I'm going to give a crop update. We're going to focus, hopefully focus primarily on, on soybeans and wheat, obviously, because that's the, the focus of, the, of our conference here. But I am going to have to talk a little bit about corn, uh, just because all the crops are so interconnected. You know, if you don't talk about corn a little bit, because what happens in corn also impacts what goes on in soybeans and wheat and vice versa. So they're all, they're all kind of interconnected here. So I do have to talk a little bit about corn. I'm going to start with that first. We're going to jump through that fairly quickly so I can get to the, the soybeans and the wheat talk. So let's just talk about really corn. We'll, we're going to start out with that first. Um, so yesterday at 11 o'clock, we got some new information out of USDA. Now, there wasn't a lot of big shock value to that. There wasn't a lot of you know, new, surprising news. We weren't expecting that at all. So just to remind everybody what goes on, every month USDA updates their forecasts for production and consumption of the major crops we grow here in the US, as well as globally. Well, now this February report, the focus was much more on what was happening globally than what was happening in the US. So the US numbers were kind of really quiet, and there just wasn't a lot of new stuff. But I will talk about a, a couple things that changed. So to understand that table, the column on the far right-hand side is the blue, in blue is the numbers we got yesterday. So that's old crop. That's for the crop that's in the bin right now. The column in the middle in green is from last year, and the column in black on the far left-hand side is from two years ago. We're going to use that as kind of reference points. Now, the production numbers, the top half of that table, is fixed. The, the numbers we got in January were the final official numbers for production. They're not going to change again. So right now, the market, it, from USDA's perspective, is just updating how fast are we consuming the available supplies we have. And again, we'll see that that doesn't change, the consumption part doesn't change a lot from month to month. So a couple things that happened when you look at what the private analysts were expecting, what they were forecasting versus what we got, it was almost an identical number. So just to remind everybody at the beginning, uh, just before, about a week or so before the USDA releases their information, um, the big private uh, um, news companies will do a survey of the private forecasting firms, the private analysts, and say, well, what do you expect the number to be? What do you think USDA is going to give us? And they average those out, and they, that kind of becomes the bench line, the benchmark or the baseline. So pretty much right on. Nobody's expecting big shifts in corn. The only shift that did occur was there was a small reduction in the ethanol consumption number. So let me explain that really quick. So this is a 12-month consumption. So the marketing year for corn and soybeans is September 1 through the end of August. So we have some information from September through the first part of February, right? So we have some real information, and they're using the forecast for the rest of the end of the year. Okay. Now the thing with ethanol is we get weekly updates. Department of Energy every week gives us information on how many gallons of, or barrels of ethanol are, are produced. We can kind of back calculate and come pretty close to how much corn we're using. So our, even though we've had some pretty good crush numbers, they're not quite as strong as we originally thought. I mean, based on seasonal patterns and everything, they think, well, this, this is going to be an OK year, not a fantastic year. Minor adjustments. So to put things again in historical context, uh, the blue line on top is feed. That's whole corn that goes into the livestock sector. It does not include corn silage. It doesn't include DDGs. This is corn that's been run through, in, through a combine, because we're counting bushels. Okay. Um, the red line is ethanol, the black line is exports, and the green line is everything else. Okay, now the dotted lines on the far right-hand side are the current USDA forecast. So this is the forecast for the full 12 months. Let's look at how the forecast is relative to what we've been doing historically and look for any major changes. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on feed and, and ethanol. There's some stories behind that, but the big one I'm going to focus on is, is exports. And even though exports only count for a little over 15% of the total corn usage, it still has a big impact on pricing, on the price of corn and price movements, because it's so hard to forecast. You don't know when you're going to have an export sale, who's going to buy it, and how much they're going to buy. 
Okay, so that kind of has that surprise or that shock value to the marketplace. Okay, and notice now also before I go on, two years ago we had our record so, uh, corn export season. And actually we beat the one in, in back here in 2006, uh, seven. So that was our record export season. Every week, USDA gives us information on both export, uh, export sales, or the, the amount of grain that has not only been sold and delivered, but also contracted for delivery in the future, which is that commitments number on the far right hand side, um, as well as ex, uh, actual loadings. But I'm gonna look at commitments. So this table shows exports by country. These columns on the far left hand side, those four are uh, 12 month totals. Okay, so those would be the mar full marketing year totals. The column on the far right hand side is this year to date. So from September 1 through February, and these, the first of February. Now these numbers came out this morning. So I was panicking this morning trying to get all these updated to make sure you had the most current information. So this is year to date sales right now that we've had so far this year. This is a year to date sales the same time last year. So we're comparing this year to last year. And then this is last year's total. So it kind of gives you a, uh, an idea of the pace at which we're selling our corn. And here's been our biggest challenge in the corn market, is our export sales for corn have been a bit slow. When we look at where we are today versus this time last year, we're down significantly. And that's been impacting the psychology of the marketplace, not only for corn, but it's had some spillover impact into wheat as well. The big difference, our number one corn buyer has been Mexico. Again, these are 12 month totals. This is only about a five month total. China, so we went from here, about a tenfold increase to here, and about a tenfold increase to there, which is our record year. What happened? It's called phase one agreement, phase one trade agreement. Up until then, uh, China had some importation restrictions because of GM traits that we had in the US. They wouldn't buy certain traits. We were able to negotiate those away so that now China can buy whatever they want to, and they will, they will acknowledge that the traits we're growing are fine. Interesting point though is this, um, this last summer, China signed a very similar trade agreement with Brazil. And they did the same thing. They brought a lot of those trade barriers, what we call non-tariff trade barriers, those phytosanitary things and the genetic things. They brought that down so they can also import, make it easier to import Brazilian corn. And some of that is happening now. Notice the big difference between what we, this time last year versus this year. Also with Japan. So we're saying corn prices are pretty good, yeah, but if you're a buyer, this really stinks. High corn prices are not really fun for buyers, and they're looking for alternatives, okay? Let's talk a little bit about what's happening corn in Brazil, and this will translate into soybeans as well, so pay attention to what I'm saying for corn because the soybean story is similar. So the weird thing about so uh, corn in Brazil is that they got two crops. They got a first crop and a second crop. Second crop is called the safrina crop. You may have heard that. That's the, the second crop, what they call their winter crop. Um, so this is just a, a comparison showing the darker the green, the more bushels are produced, or metric ton. So first crop, first season, is when they plant and harvest soybeans. So they're planting and harvesting soybeans and corn at the same time, just like we do here or in, in Illinois. The second season crop is when they finish harvesting soybeans, they come back and plant corn. So in the old days, they did soybeans on soybeans on soybeans they ran into problems. You can't do that forever. So now they're doing a corn soybean rotation. As soon as soy, soybeans are harvested, they plant second crop corn. Second crop corn, safrina, that counts for about 75% of the total bushels produced. First crop corn, about 25%. Now what's interesting is though that most of the big export facilities are right down here in this little hook, right back down in here. And so when it looks, look at exporting corn, how do you get it from the field to a, an export facility, there's a bunch of short line railroads that are running in the southern part. And they're pretty, pretty new, pretty efficient. So it's reasonably easy to get corn from the southern part into a port and export it. And notice back over here, they actually have some second crop corn that can also be exported really easily. Now to move it from Mato Grosso down to a port is exceptionally expensive because you gotta truck it. There aren't any long haul railroads. And to go from the middle of Mato Grosso down to Paranagua, so from Soroso, Mato, Mato Grosso down to Paranagua, which is their, one, of, one of the two big ports, that's like driving from Fargo to Frisco. Okay, so just think about that for a minute. You're gonna load your semi up, and you're gonna drive it to an elevator. 
and you load it up and you drive from Fargo to Frisco. Well, it's not a dirt road. They got it paved, but it's kind of like a US Highway 2 paved. It, you're still bouncing pretty good as you're going up and down the road. So obviously you're not gonna get two or three loads a day. <laughs> All right, okay, so hauling corn from here down to port doesn't make a lot of sense. Hauling soybeans down to port is, they gotta do it, but it's really expensive. They got about a two or three dollar basis, that's what the co transportation cost is. Okay, now here's where they produce soybeans, so let me go back. Um, so I, just this little bump right here, notice this little bump, you go straight across, so kind of that's middle of Mato Grosso, okay? Now, this is where they plant corn. It's also where they plant soybeans. So the corn and soybean um, in Argentina is right on top of each other. And right now, the big story is in Argentina. Argentina is having a severe drought. Their soybean yields are dropping rapidly. Their corn yields are dropping rapidly. I'll show you some maps in just a minute. So here's Uruguay. There's southern Brazil. And notice this river. This is river mouth. This is the Paranagua River that runs like this. This is their core producing region. So just think about this, this river port right here kind of going diagonally. Okay, here's a map. Now this would be an NDVI, the vegetative index. So this is looking at the, the greenness of the crop today versus history. So if it's, if it's white, it's equal. If it's green, it's better. If it's red, it's worse. What do you think about the corn and soybean? Now this is all crops. So it's corn, soybeans, cotton, sugarcane, everything that they grow. It's not just one crop. How does that look? So again, recognizing that this is the bump. Go straight across, there's the middle of Mato Grosso. Looks good, corn and soybeans look good, except for this southern tip right down here, right? So translation, corn and soybean crop out of Brazil is gonna be good to excellent. Good to excellent. What about Argentina? So here's Paraguay, there's our river. The big growing region is kind of right in here. So some of their crop is in really dire straits right now, which is what you see on social media, and some of it's in like okay shape, but it's deteriorating quickly. So the corn and soybeans right now, um, as far as crop development, the corn is just starting to, to uh, silk and pollinate. And the soybean crop is just finishing flowering and setting into pod set. So these are really critical development stages for yield. So the next couple of weeks are gonna be critically important for the yield potential for both corn and beans out of Brazil. I mean, out of Argentina. The Brazilian crop is in pretty good shape. In fact, Brazil's already harvested about seven or eight percent of their soybeans. So northern part, they've already, the combines are running. Looking at carryover stocks, so this is the, I want to look at the blue bars. This is stocks to use ratio, it's scored on the right hand side. The soybean numbers, the wheat numbers will look identical. What we're doing is we're taking our ending stocks, the amount of grain we have left over just before harvest, and we divide by the total consumption. So what percent of our needs do we have in reserve in case there's a problem? The reason I show this is there's a really strong correlation, relationship between average prices you see in the marketplace and how much inventory we have. So we have a very little inventory, we tend to have high prices, right? If we have a lot of inventory, we tend to have lower prices. But it also impacts price volatility, the variability of prices. So if our margin for error is really tiny, we tend to have higher average prices with a lot of bouncing around. If we have a lot of inventory, we tend to have lower average prices and more stable prices. So I want to show this graphic versus what we see in the marketplace. Here's 1996, that's our record low. Here's where we are today. This is 2011, 12, and 13. Okay, now realize back here in the 16, 17, 18, we had some pretty high inventories. Here's a long-term price chart for corn. Do you see a correlation? Here's nine, now, this has not been adjusted for inflation. So the 1996, that's in 1996 dollars. It's too complicated to adjust, so I just, I can pull this chart really easy so I can keep it updated. All right, so here's 1996, here's 2011, 12, and 13. Here's where we were this last summer. Look at the price volatility we've had. You see the correlation. Now, go back a few years, 15, 16, 17, 18, much lower prices, much less volatility. The blue box right there is the futures price for March as of 10 o'clock this morning. So that's where we are basically today for old crop soybeans. What do you think the path of least resistance is for price corn prices? Probably down, unless something happens. So let's look at old crop. So this is March, 
So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be pricing off the March contract. That's the contract the elevator is using today if you were to deliver corn to the ethanol plant or, or the elevator today. Okay. What do you see? Now, I drew in these, these green lines and the blue lines. Look at the price trend. And this is, again, as about 10 o'clock this morning. What do you see as the price trend? What are you, what are you looking at for price trends here? Pretty flat, right? We've got kind of a trading range going on, haven't we? So what do you think is going to happen to corn prices for the next couple of weeks? Probably be flat, right? Until when? March 31. March 31. Well, I think it might be some sparks before March 31. Okay. And what I'm because this is old crop. This is old crop. I'll show you a new crop in a sec. So what are some of the things that might change that? Brazil, U.S. is the largest corn exporter. Brazil is the second largest corn exporter. Argentina is the third largest corn exporter. And then it was Ukraine after that, but Ukraine isn't really doing much anymore. So we're back down to kind of the big three. What do you think might happen to the Argentine corn crop if it's just starting to pollinate? Right? Now, some of this is already built into the futures market, right? But we don't know how bad it's going to get. So I agree with you. I think for the next couple of weeks, we'll probably have kind of bouncing around within that trading range unless we start having a bigger problem in South America, particularly Argentina, and or we start to see some uh, export sales. Some of those countries that we're waiting to buy off of Brazil or Argentina are now getting nervous, saying, look, we better backfill with some U.S. purchases. Make sense? So be watching and listening for that on the radio. How about new crop? Do you see price changes in new crop? Pretty much flat, right? Until when? March 31. So here's my question to you. Are we going to have a great big price rally with a big battle for acres coming into 2023? Is everybody out there aggressively bidding and saying, oh, my God, we've got to get some more acres? No. My opinion, my opinion for whatever that's worth is, I think we're looking for the right balance of acres. I don't know that there's a real big like surge to say, God, we could have you know, 5 million more acres of corn or 5 million more acres of beans. This is a matter of a balancing act. Okay, and I think we're going to look for that balance. I don't know that there's going to be any big superior rallies unless we have something politically happen. And obviously that can happen tomorrow, and I'm not a good... I can't forecast politics, guys. Just I've tried, and I'm just really crappy at it, so don't even ask me. Let's jump into soybeans. Same basic story for soybeans, kind of the same variables that we're looking at. Ending stocks numbers, we were a little bit bigger than, than what the trade was expecting, but still we're well within the range. The reason that came out a little bit higher was because USDA did cut the crushings report. So the amount of soybeans we've been crushing. They were expecting a very large, long, aggressive crushing program, and that's backed off the last couple months. It's still very good crush, crush numbers, but it's just not quite as aggressive as what we had seen earlier in the season. So let's talk about crush. So the blue line on top is crushing demand, the amount of soybeans going into the crush industry. The red one is exports, little dots of the current USDA forecast. Notice the nice upward trend in crushing demand. What do you think is going to happen to that blue line over the next couple of years? It, it, it'll probably tip up a little bit, right? Now, the big question is how quickly will it tip up and how fast, okay? And this is, there's a long backstory here. There's currently, it depends upon who you listen to, I've seen as much as 19 new plants, but I'm going to use this number because 14 new plants either under construction, under expansion, or under development. Those are three very different things. Expansion means it's an existing plant growing. Uh, new construction is a brand new facility. A development means they're pushing paper instead of pushing dirt. So those under development things may or may not occur. But theoretically, if all 14 of those were to be built and add about 450 million bushels of crush, that'd be about a 20% increase in our ability to crush soybeans. Now, I think that's a little aggressive. I don't know that all of those plants will be built, but we are looking at an expansion, obviously. Now, anybody in the room getting price bids from green, uh, green Bison Energy out of Spiritwood? I am. They're contracting for 2023 soybeans right now. I'm getting bid sheets about every other day. 
I've got the most recent bid sheet here. We should get another one today. Right now, 2020, this is as of the 6th of February. November 2023, delivery into Spiritwood is at a minus 35. If I, look at, if I look at an unnamed elevator in Valley City, they're looking at a minus 50 for new crop soybeans. So about a 15 cent price spread. Now, interestingly enough, green bison, by the time you get, for November, it's minus 35. December delivery, it's minus 25. January delivery, minus 20. February delivery, minus 15. March delivery, minus 10. By the time you get to April, it's zero. Zero basis for April delivery. Why does it go from a minus 35 to a zero? Yep. And they're trying to incentivize storage. And this has always been my debate with people in how much of a basis bump you're going to get with a crush plant. And I keep telling people all the crusher has to do is bid just high enough it doesn't get on a train and leave. Well, in January, I mean, in, in November, it doesn't take a lot, doesn't take an aggressive bid to prevent it from getting on a train and leaving in November. Now, what kind of a bid do you have to put together in April, for April delivery to prevent it from getting on a train in November? Now we're looking at the cost of interest, the cost of storage, the cost of carry. And guys, do the math. If you don't remember anything else that I say in this presentation, do the math on the cost of storage. Your interest and your carry cost have gone up significantly. They have essentially doubled in the last six months because of interest. Interest rates have increased. Your operating lines of, of credit have increased. You've got to borrow more money. It's going to cost more to store it. Do the math. And don't use the elevator bid as a proxy. Because the elevator guys are, are, are basically right now subsidizing storage to try and get the grain to move to them. Your full cost of carry is more for soybeans is way more than six cents a bushel. <laughs> way more. Do the math. Everybody's different. Here's my point. I can't come up with a number. Everybody's number is different. You're all in a different situation, whether you're you know, trying to pay for the bin or not. There's a thousand things that go into this, so I don't want to make a generic statement. OK, let's keep moving, or I'll never get done. What about uh, exports? Again, 12-month totals. This is year to date as of the information we got this morning. And trust me, guys, I was scrambling <coughs> to put this all together. Um, here's the number as of, as of the most recent we have. This is where we were this time last year. We're, we're a little bit ahead. Now, I do expect that to change pretty quickly. When because, does it, what's that? When does it end? When does it, uh, end of August. So September 1 through August 31. OK? So, so this is through August 31. This is through uh, February 3rd of last year. OK, so they're the same crop year. It's just timing differences. So what happens is, our export pace drops off like a rock once the Brazilian harvest starts. Last year, what happened was the Brazilian soybeans got planted late and slow because it was really wet last spring, which meant our export season was extended. We, we, we were able to export soybeans longer than normal. This year, exact opposite. The soybean crop in Brazil was planted early and quickly. They're already harvesting. They're a month ahead of time. Our export season's done. Our big export seed, we're done exporting soybeans except to our number two customer, which is Mexico, or our number three customer, which is European Union. The Chinese aren't buying from us anymore. If they do, it's very little. Okay? Which means I think this number won't grow very quickly. This number we still, based on last year, we still had quite a few months of good export season. So what happened to your basis levels for soybeans? You guys looked at what the February basis level is? It went in January. There's, I, went, I looked at Maple River Grain. I'll just tell you. I looked at Maple River Grain. In February, they had, I think, a minus 40 basis for Jan. They had a minus 65 basis for Feb. Pricing off the same futures month. You know what my unnamed elevator in, in, uh, in um, Valley City is right now for current delivery? Minus 90. For February delivery, it's there at minus 90. What is that telling you? 
They don't need it. Now, every elevator is going to be different. But I, that was as of yesterday. They were at a minus 90. So what is that saying? Our export season's done. If you want to send it, fine. You can, you can sell it right now. They're going to find a different home for it. OK, so I'm going to skip over this just to get through time. Let's look at ending stocks for soybeans. Again, I just want to show this relationship. We're at about 5% right now. Our record low is back here in 2013. Here's where we were during the trade war. We got up to about 20, what is it, 23, 24%. Look at the price relationships. And look at the price volatility. Here's where we were 2012, 13, and 14. Here's where we were last, this last summer. This is where we were just as we started harvest and we found out we didn't have quite as many beans. Got it. Old crop soybeans. Look at the price trend in the futures. And by the way, this 1572, that was the high we saw back here in June for March. Not the spot, but for March. Okay, so when we think about psychological barriers, the support and resistance levels, 1550, we're at, at uh, 1515 as of 10 o'clock this morning. I think that 1550 will hold, will hold. We've already lost the basis. So right now, what are you gambling on? If you're storing soybeans right now, what are you gambling on? The futures, futures only, because there's no carry in the basis. What might cause the futures to go higher for old crop? Argentina, will Argentina be enough? I don't think so. So let me go back. Okay, so where is it going? I don't know. Do I care? Do we care? <laughs> <laughs> do you care? Yes, you do care. Well, futures are, must be inverted. The futures are inverted, absolutely. If you look at the futures, the futures are inverted. Yep, yep, the futures, the futures for corn, soybeans, and wheat are all inverted. It's probably going to Aberdeen, to be honest with you. That's a whole other story. That's, that, that's a sidebar conversation. So let's talk about Argentina versus Brazil really quick, because I'm going to run out of time for, for wheat, which is what everybody came for, right? Um, so this is soybean production in Brazil. This is soybean production in the United States. This is soybean production in Argentina. Little dots are the current USDA forecast. They did bring, USDA brought this from 145 down to 141. A lot of the private forecasters are now thinking about 136 uh, to, excuse me, from they went from 45 down to 41. A lot of private guys are at anywhere from 35 to 36 for Argentina. However, look at the increase in Brazil. The increase in Brazil way more than offsets the loss in Argentina. And the other thing you got to realize, are this is exports. Now, this is total production. This is exports. This is exports of whole soy. Look at the amount, and this is zero, guys. Look at the amount of soybean whole soybeans that Argentina export? Almost nothing. What are they doing with their soybeans? They crush it. They export oil and the meal. They don't export whole soybeans. Okay, the red line is the imports of soybeans by China. Now, this is all imports by China, regardless of where they buy it from. So here's Argentina. This is the United States. Those are really the two big markets for whole soybeans. Right now, China is buying about 30% of their soybeans, total soybeans from the United States. The rest is coming primarily from Brazil. <coughs> so how much of an impact will a short crop in Argentina really have on soybean prices? Not much. Not much. There will be a psychological bounce. right? Psychologically, everybody's going to get nervous because they say, well, OK, that'll if soybeans, if the meal and oil can't be sold by Argentina, That'll reflect in futures markets here in the United States, which will back calculate into the soybeans, right? So I'm not saying it's zero, but it's not as much as you think. So now let's go to new crop. Here's new crop soybeans. There's old crop soybeans. We got a nice upward trend, primarily because of South America having some problems. How long will that continue? I don't know. How about new crop soybeans? 
The only reason we got this bump in new crop soybeans is because Argentina started having problems. If Argentina would have had a, a, normal, a normal crop, it would have kept sliding, in my opinion. We've already seen these. I'll continue on. Can I make two comments on wheat? Yep. All right, two comments on wheat. Um, first, winter wheat. Winter wheat seedings was actually up about 3 million acres. About 2 million of that was in hard red winter wheat, which is Kansas. Here's the drought monitor map for Kansas wheat. Not in good condition, but it's not dead. Okay, guys? Yet. Just, well, I don't know. Well, you guys know I've, I've lost way too much money banking on the fact that winter wheat's dead, and it ain't, guys. So it's in dormancy. The question is, when will it break dormancy? Probably in mid-March. If they get some rains at the right time, it will stool out, and it'll be fine, guys. So do not count the winter wheat out. This is my other problem. So this is uh, hard red spring wheat exports. So here's our the red line is exports for spring wheat. We are up a little bit relative to this time last year, but our general trend has been lower. The other thing I want to point out, Philippines has historically been our number one customer. This year, notice the growth trend in Mexican exports. And this is year to date. They are now past, they have right now surpassed Japan as our new number two customer. Who were they getting it before? Some from Canada, but their total demand for spring wheat has actually increased. Just like a lot of US millers, they found out by adding a little bit of spring wheat, you can get some higher low volume, higher water absorption rate. Translation is you can sell the consumer more water and more air. Any, any customer, any company I know of will love to sell customers with more water and more air. But they still got to get it either from Canada or from the U.S. down there, and that logistics gets to be an issue for them. And with that, I better quit. Questions? I have a question on the uh, winter wheat. Because, uh, with the, price, uh, the crop prices take, take a lot of years, they'll wait to plant winter wheat because of the fact that they don't have a guarantee. But this year, they planned it early. And one thing about winter wheat is it has to go through dormancy, and there's a lot yep. of wheat down there that supposedly has not sprouted. Be very, be very careful, because North Dakota is the only state that you plant winter wheat and it is insured as spring wheat. Every other state, you plant winter wheat, it's insured as winter wheat, insurance covers winter kill. South Dakota, all the way down into Texas. So the Kansas crop, you plant winter wheat, you insure it as winter wheat, drought damage or, or winter kill is covered by crop insurance. North Dakota is the only state that when you plant winter wheat, it has to be inspected in the spring and is insured as spring wheat. So winter kill is not covered. But so you've got to be very careful about it. Yeah, uh, it's, has to go through it does, it doesn't produce a head. correct, correct, so it, it went, through, it, it sprouted, there was enough moisture for it to sprout. I read somewhere where a lot of it didn't sprout. There was a lot that didn't, but there's enough, it, it, and it varies a lot, but depending on where you are, it varies a lot, depending, you had a question, sir. Yeah, quick question on infrastructure in yep. Brazil. Yep. Is there infrastructure work going on, and if it is, who's, who's investing in it? Okay, so I've got a, See if I can find that. Hang on, where to go? Oh, come on. There it is. Shoot. Right here. That's how grain flows. Yep, let's do that one. So um, this, the yellow, is where the Amazon jungle is. So this is their major producing area. The arrows is where the grain flows. Their traditional big ports, all these blue dots are ports. The big ports, the Santos and Paranagua, are the two really big ones. They are starting to move some north into the Amazon River, trying to barge it to an export terminal out here by the sea. But the Amazon doesn't, it's not like our Mississippi that has a bunch of locks at NAM, so it's really hard to do that. So still, the majority is going from here south. That's primarily what they call the BR-163. It's that two-lane road that I talked, the Highway 2 that they go, right? They don't have any long haul rail. Most of the new infrastructure has been at port. They're making the port facilities bigger and more efficient. There is a consortium of international investors that are working on, and the Brazilian government approved, 
building a long haul railroad from the middle of Brazil, from the middle of Mato Grosso down to the port. It's still gonna be years before that gets built because it's gonna take a long time. So there's a ton of money going into it, but most so far has been in the port facilities trying to make it the throughput faster. It's not internal logistics. Where's the money coming from? All over the globe. Some of it is coming directly from China. Uh, a lot of it is coming from our ABCDs, um, ADM, Cargill, Bungie, Dreyfus, you know, the traditional grain merchandisers, because they're investing in their own facilities. You had another question over here? Somebody, yeah. Yep. 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 So did you hear that? So the, the, the comment that, that um, Claire said was that winter wheat, um, as long as it sprouts and starts to develop, can vernalize. So it doesn't have to have above ground growth. Now there's still, I mean, it's in very poor condition, so it's not that it's gonna make it throughout the winter, but at least it, there, it, there's enough growth there that it will vernalize and it can re-sprout next spring and start to grow again. But if it's, if it's seed that hasn't germinated, obviously that's not gonna do anything. Yeah. Yep. And, and there's also, normally what happens is if they have enough moisture, they'll go out and put some fall calves on it. They'll, they'll grass fed the calves. They got pulled off this, they didn't, they didn't do this, the fall grazing because there wasn't enough aftermath. They were really concerned they were gonna kill the wheat. And so the counter to that is you normally see some really heavy grazing and some of that would actually get grazed down. That didn't happen this last fall. So some of those calves were sold off. So there's some, there's some counter things. Again, I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't bet money on a really bad winter wheat crop yet. It's too, way too early. Okay, so, so with, with that, that, thank you. Yep, if you have any more questions, Brain is around. I'll okay. hang around.